on this beautiful Sunday morning. I love that there's a breeze. Not too hot. I do have a couple of announcements for y'all. Of course, tonight at 5, we do have our Sunday evening prayer time back at the main church. And then every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. during first service, we do have Sunday school over in the annex. It's a great way to dig deeper into God's word. Uh, if you have any questions, please see Ms. Carol Lee. And then our next outdoor service will be September 17th. Now, if you will all stand with me, we'll go into the school town square. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this beautiful weather outside that is not too hot, Lord. I thank you for bringing us all here this morning. I pray that you use this service the way you want it to be used. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Still plenty of things up front. I know y'all love them so much. <laughs> The scriptures say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord.
been out on this uh, great piece of land. Somebody yeah. say, praise, praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. You can be seated for just a moment. Uh, Pastor Jason, would you mind to bring that uh, thermometer looking thing out here? We're going to uh, talk about that. So I have, I, I told you that I have some good news about the uh, uh, paying off of the mortgage in this property. And uh, so with since May, since May, there has been $32,000 approximately that has come in towards paying the land off. Now instead of $60,000 in May, we now only owe $28,459.36. And it's because of your faithfulness, it's because of your giving. And can I tell you that we just have reason to celebrate because we serve a good God. And, and, and He's faithful and He's true and He's loving and He's merciful. Uh, and I'm just excited to serve the Lord. Uh, I just want to say thank you. I'm not going to read a scripture because I believe that you guys have already been indoctrinated into giving. That is a part of your heart. That is a part of who we are as a church. That we are a giving church. Not just a receiving church, but a church that gives out into the community and blesses the community. Uh, and does wonderful things to help people and to bless uh, ministries. And so I just want to congratulate you and say that God notices when you give. God's faithful and God blesses and He's powerful and He's a wonderful God. So I'm going to give Him some praise this morning. Give a hand clap. Would you stand with me as we uh, pray over the offering this morning? There is a uh, box in the back, I believe, near Bill. If you want to drop your tithes and offering in there, uh, you can do that. And uh, what a wonderful, beautiful day. Isn't it just an amazing day today? To, to be out here, and it's hot out there in the sun, but we're in the shade, and God's blessed us. Let's pray over this. Father God, we thank you. We celebrate, Lord. We celebrate you more than we celebrate anything that uh, we have done, God. We celebrate that you are a good, merciful, powerful, wonderful God. You're worthy to be praised and honored and blessed. Lord, we lift high your name today, God. We bless you and honor you, Lord. We roll out the red carpet of praise and Lord, we ask that you would simply come down and be in the midst of your people, God. Lord, that you would touch hearts, that you would change lives. God, that you would heal bodies because that's the kind of God you are. Lord, we thank you in advance. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. God, thank you for the jobs that you've given these folks, Lord. Thank you for their occupations, for their businesses, Lord. I thank you, God, for blessing them and blessing their family. Lord, I thank you for a great number of people that are out here to just bless and worship your name, God. And we uh, want to honor you today, Lord. Have your way and your will in this place. And everybody said, Amen. 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 This place the Lord. The scriptures say, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. We are in the presence of God and we are here to praise Him.
is good. Amen. Amen. He's good. Would you remain standing with me as we declare that this is the word of God, that it's sharp, that it's powerful, that it's quick. Can I tell you that uh, the last, this past weekend, we were in uh, Underwood, Indiana, and the last speaker talked about that you can have all kinds of good programs, you can have all kinds of uh, even great speakers, you can have all kinds of all those different things, but it will not be what God desires if it isn't lining up according to the book. Amen? Uh, can I tell you that you hold the book in your hand today, whether it's in your uh, phone or your iPad or your electronic device or you have a hard copy here like I do, I want you to know that we are uh, called to live by the book. Look at your neighbor and say, live by the book. Amen. Would you hold it up today? Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go ahead and let you sit down this morning because we want to share a testimony. I'm going to ask Barbara to come this morning. She uh, sent me an email uh, this past week about how God is uh, using her. Somebody get her a microphone. About how God is using her uh, in uh, her workplace and how God's just blessing and opportunities and doors uh, that are opening up. And uh, I'm excited about it. You tell me. Right. About a year ago, I told you guys about a bracelet and keychain that I did. There at the hospital. This is the bracelet. And this is the keychain. I have a fist to that. Anyway, um, the young lady has been back since then, three years sober. I had another lady who I didn't even, sorry, recognize. And the doctor came out and said, Barbara, I've been sick. She'd like to see you at this time. I'm going, okay. So I go in and she says, do you remember me? And that's the way I said, I'm sorry. I see so many people. I don't, but I'm glad you. So she told me that she was doing well, but her husband's last boyfriend was going to be having me to the bracelet. So I went to my car, got the bracelet, and come back and she says, there are 30 women at the Isaiah house that would love to hear you tell about the other girl that you told me about. Is there any way you could come up there and bring 30 breakfast to you? Wow. Well, I tell you all, I work for the week, and I don't have money to buy that many breakfasts. <laughs> so I ordered them anyway because I knew God was going to do it. Amen. So I ordered the bracelets. And I know you have on the phone. I know that. I know that. But, but it's free. So I had a $5 free in the mail. Red model thing. So I got the machine. Get three times a month. I'm going to go to $35. Price it all. I'm going to go to $35. I'm going to go to $35. I'm going to go to $35.
to participate in communion when we're out here together at the property. Because there's just something special about being together. It, Amen. God's good to us. Uh, you know, as I was on my way to, to the pavilion this morning, I just began to think about, you know, when Jesus was with his disciples before he gave them communion and instituted this uh, new thing, he knew that it would be the last time that he was together with them before going to the cross. He knew that. I think the disciples even began to realize that there was something special about this time. They might not have known that Jesus was about to go to the cross, but they knew that it was something special. And I want you to understand that what we do today is something special. Imagine if you are Jesus' disciple and looking in retrospect after he's gone to the cross, after he's raised from the dead, and you look back, can I tell you that sometimes you don't even realize the blessing that you have when you're in it. Amen. But many times you look back at the blessing and how special and how important it was. I begin to think about this congregation as I was on the way over here. And there's been some folks that have passed and gone off the glory. I had communion with them here. But the word says that he will return. And that you will be called up to meet them in the air. And so one day, those special people that I had communion with here... I'm going to have the very supper of the Lamb of okay? God. And we're going to commune and be in God's presence. What a glorious thought this morning. Can I tell you that I love you this morning? And there's not a thing you can do about it. <laughs> God's good, isn't he? Let's read this together. For I received from the Lord that which I deliver to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. They should take it again. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake of the cup. Can we just raise our hands and thank the Lord? He's been so good. There's so many blessings that we can look back on. He's touched our families. He's saved them. He's healed our bodies. And those things are wonderful. But most of all, He saved our soul. When we were on the way to a hell that was created for the devil, Jesus came. And He became our champion. And He saved us from ourselves. He saved us from our sin. Lord, we just want to praise you for that, Lord. We honor you today. Thank you for your presence that we feel so real. Lord, even as the wind blows across this place, we feel your presence sweeping across this uh, pavilion, Lord, touching hearts, lives, changing destinies, God, moving in ways that only you can. We thank you for your blood. We thank you for your body and that ultimate sacrifice that you gave. And everybody said, Amen. 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 This morning we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Now when we were at man camp this past week, the very first speaker, I kid you not, got up and read the scripture <laughs> that I was going to preach on. Uh, and, and I just said, guys, 
I'm just going to have to apologize in advance because I ain't changing because everybody else there is going to need to hear it too. Okay? Uh, but actually, this sermon is a little different. I mean, knows that the Word of God applies to our lives right where we are. It is the living Word of God. It's powerful uh, and it's uh, an amazing Word. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're only going to read the first four verses, but I'm going to refer to the whole story. How many have ever read or heard the story of David and Goliath? Would you raise your hands? Thank you, thank you. Let's read them together. There are a few words that I'd like for you to repeat with me. It says, now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. They gathered to battle. Gathered to battle. And were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together. And they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between. Say, a valley in between. A valley in between. And a champion. Say, champion. Champion. A champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, who was, whose height was six cubits and a span. May God add a blessing upon the reading of his word. Would you stretch your hands this way? Ask the Lord to bless me as I can bring his word. Father God, we thank you uh, for your word. Thank you for the opportunity, God, to uh, just give forth the, the, the bread of life to your people, Lord. I pray that you would give me the wisdom, God, that you would give me the utterance and the unctioning power of your spirit. Lord, we have already declared that we are intent upon listening to your word so that it will change us. And God, we believe that that's going to happen right now. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So as we look at this 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, what I first want us to look at is the scene. You have the Philistines on one mountain, and you have the children of God, the army of Israel, on the other mountain. And there's a valley in between. You see, many times we read scripture and, and, and we really don't uh, pick out those little things. Because the little things make the difference. Right. But the valley, I mean, those for every two mountains, there's a valley. Amen? Yeah. Uh, and then can I tell you, if you're in the valley, just get ready because another mountain's got to be around somewhere. Amen? Yeah, uh, so, but the valley is important here. And as they were gathered there, the Philistines came to do battle. Your enemy, the devil, is no joke. Right. He's real. Yeah. Uh, he has uh, come to steal, to kill, and to destroy, the Bible tells yeah. us. Uh, he's no joke. And he, and he comes a, against us. And we look here, and it tells us the, the Philistines were encamped at Soko. Now, you can stop right there and you say, what, what, I don't care. What does that matter? Which belonged to Judah. Can I tell you that the devil is nothing but a poacher? A, a poacher is, uh, I had to write it down because this came to me a little bit later. A person is a, a, who is a poacher encroaches or usurps another person's rights. Yeah. Israel held... Soko and held uh, this place and it was theirs. But they had allowed the enemy to come in and to steal. Somebody said, I'll take it back when the enemy stole this morning. And, and so we see that and, and, and what I want you to know is that the devil's a poacher. If God has given it to you and he has declared it to you in his word, then the, the devil can just simply take his hands off of it uh, and we can stand upon the authority and the power that God has given to us. Uh, somebody say, I'm taking back my territory this morning. Uh, and the devil is nothing more than a poacher. Here's Israel and the Philistines in a standoff. One on this mountaintop, one on this mountaintop, and the valley in between. And they had been there 40 days. Now, in the Bible, 40 days is significant. 
Because God seems to move and change the situation and intervene many, many times in 40 days. You read it throughout the scripture. And, and, and it was prime time for God to step in and to defeat the enemy and to move and to give back the territory that the Israelites had already owned. Right. 40 days. It seems that God always uh, intervenes and he initiates a significant change in 40 days. But what's so important about this valley of Ubar? If the Philistines were able to take this valley, then they were, would be able to advance on to Bethlehem, and there they would be able to spread all across Israel. It was a strategic battle, I want you to know. Uh, if the Philistines were, were to overcome Israel, then it would be much easier for them to go and take all of the rest of the territory. They were in a standoff. That's why you see David's oldest three brothers there. Because if they were successful, the Philistines were successful in Elah, then their hometown, Bethlehem, was right for invasion. Can I tell you, you need to stand up for your home place. Amen. Amen. You, men, especially, we, we've heard this all weekend long. Stand up for your family. Amen. Stand up for God. Yeah. Take your rightful place. Don't let the enemy come in and take your family from you and abuse your family, but take your authority in the Lord. Hallelujah. So they were protecting their homes. Forty days. If you don't think forty days is a long time, try fasting for forty days. Forty days, evening and morning, this uh Giant, this Goliath shows up and he defies the armies of Israel and he defies the God of Israel and he challenges them. Send me one man. Somebody say one man. One man. Send me one man that he would fight against me. And if you win, then we'll be your servants. But if we win, then you will be our servants. Yeah. Yeah. Are you up for the challenge? Can I tell you that you can never trust what the devil tells you? That's right. For when Israel did win this battle, when they did, the enemy didn't say, okay, we're going to be your servants. They ran for their lives. They said the enemy's a liar. And he's the father of all lies, the Bible tells us. Here is this massive giant, this massive man. And then uh, if you read your commentaries, they would say that he uh, was something like eight foot five to nine foot nine. He is a massive, uh, huge specimen uh, of a man, not just big, but gigantic compared to David. His weapons weighed 150 to 200 pounds. And it says of Goliath that he was the Philistine champion. Man, I wish I had some Rocky music on right now. <laughs> you, you know, the, the, the challenge. Uh, here is this giant of a man who stands up before all of Israel. And he declares that, that he's defying God. And he's defying the armies of Israel. And he's saying, so, can, I, can, I, can I just give you a picture? He's pounding his chest and he's saying, I defy you. I defy your God. Somebody sent somebody to challenge me. Yeah. And he's there. And every day for 40 days, Israel came out dressed in their battle armor. They lined up. They prepared for battle. There is a difference between putting on the army array and actually fighting. Amen. You can put on your Christian clothes on Sunday morning and come to church and never really be in the army of the Lord. You can pretend. You can even read your Bible, but are you committed to the Lord that you are a part of His army? And, and I imagine that here in Israel, they come out and then they're already, and, and the Bible tells us they're even hooping and hollering and cheering. 
But you can say anything with your mouth yeah, yeah. and not do it with power and not do it with authority and not actually. Uh, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. dead. So we're called to be uh, champions for the Lord. This Israelite army dressed in battle gear. What is that, Rocky? <laughs> <laughs> the, the champion. That's good. That's good. The Israelite army dressed in their battle gear. I wonder how many times we come and we're dressed in our Christian gear, but we're not really a part of the army. Amen. That's the truth, brother. Uh -huh. how, how many times do we get all dressed up and, and, and ready, but we don't really do what God's called us to do? I wonder sometimes. Here are these Israelites, intimidated, fear and confusion all around them. Can I tell you that fear and confusion are the tactics of the devil? And here's Saul, the king of Israel. And he has reason to be afraid more than any of them. For the Bible tells us that he was head and shoulders above everybody. Uh, if I had Josh come up here, you would see that he's pretty much head and shoulders above me. He is a, a, a this giant is a, is a massive man, and, and the king of Israel is the biggest of the Israelites. And it should have been him to face off against Goliath. He should have been considered the champion, but he was not. Why? Hear me. This is, this is one of the most important things you'll hear today. Because the spirit of the Lord has departed from him. If you don't have the spirit of God in you, fighting for you, giving you the courage, helping you to win this battle, you'll never make it. And when that happens, just like Saul, when the spirit left him, so did his courage. And he's trying to recruit everybody and anybody to go fight Goliath when it should have been him. And along comes the beloved David, the little shepherd boy, sent by his father, Jesse, bring the boys some bread and some cheese and, and uh, go down and get me some news from the battlefront. Go down there and, and, and talk with them and see what's going on. And David comes and he sees this pathetic army of Israel that's all dressed up, all kinds of places that they ought to be going, but they're frightened out of their mind and stepping back every time Goliath comes to speak a word. Uh -huh. Sorry, gentlemen, who were there. All David had done, or Goliath had done at this point was just talk. That's all he had done. He hadn't exhibited any strength, any power. He hadn't come after Israel. Can I tell you that the devil likes to talk, but he doesn't always uh, come. Uh, he doesn't always have the power to do what he declares that he has to do. Amen. 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 And here is David. He comes. He sees this pathetic army of God. He hears Goliath's words, the challenge. And he discovers that Saul has offered a reward to the man who will fight Goliath. Right. He said, your family ain't going to have to pay no taxes. Who would be signing up for that this morning? Yeah. That's, that's, a good, that's, a, that's a good reward. And you're going to give this lovely princess my daughter. I ain't going to sign up for that because I already got one wife. That's enough. But, but maybe you young men might sign up for the princess. You know what I'm saying? That reward. And David is inquiring. What is this story? What is this that he's offering? And his oldest brother finds out. And he said, you came down here because you're full of pride. And you just wanted to find out the story. But David wasn't full of pride. David had a different motivation. He looks at his brother and he says... What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Amen. I want you to understand that there is a cause. 
uh, it's not just about getting dressed up and, and ready for church and uh, having on your Christian attire. It's yeah. not about that. But there is a cause. And I've told you many times that the cause is that people come to know the living, saving Lord, Jesus yeah. Christ, who shed his blood for them. And to they get saved and brought from one kingdom into another. Look at your neighbor say, there's a cause. There's a cause. And that's David's motivation. Not his own safety, not his own personal glory, but the glory and the cause of God. Saul received some good news. Can you imagine? He's scared out of his wits. He gets some good news. Somebody has volunteered. Woo, praise the Lord. I mean, I don't have to fight that big old boy. Uh, but the good news turned into bad news when he found out it was a little shepherd boy. <laughs> Hallelujah. And can I tell you that Saul was not impressed right. with David. <laughs> not yet. He's just a boy. You will not be able to fight him. You gotta watch who you got by your side, because they will whisper things in your ear and tell you stuff that ain't true. Yes. I'm here to tell you today that you can fight the enemy with God on your side, and you can be victorious, and you can do what God's called you to do. Yes. Look at your neighbor and say, We can. Well, yeah. He said, This giant has been a soldier longer than you have been alive. And David said, But I remember. You need to remember. I talked about remembering in, in our communion service. Remember the victories that God has given to you. Remember how he stepped in. Remember how he empowered you to do things that you felt like were impossible. Am I preaching this morning? And David said, I remember that there was a time whenever uh, there was a lion uh, and a time that there was a bear that came after the sheep but I grabbed that old lion by the jaw and I ripped him in two and I did the same to the bear. And that big old giant Goliath, he's no different. He'll end up with the same thing. Thank you, Jesus. This powerful young boy. Can I tell you that Saul thought he wasn't prepared, but God had already been preparing him. Amen. Can, can I just meddle a little bit? So many times we say, oh, I'm just overcome. Uh, the, the circumstances and the situations in my life, and I just don't know if I'm going to make it, Pastor. God is preparing you to win the battle. It's just a lion. It's just a bear. But the giant is on his way. And guess what? The good news is, you're going to be prepared. Amen. Have I say, send me the battle. <laughs> Amen. Saul believed there's no way that David could win. But David knew there was no way he could lose. Saul wasn't convinced that uh, what David had to offer was enough. So he said, here, won't you take my armor? But David tried it on. And it didn't fit him right. And it was, I don't know if it was too big, but what I want you to know that it was an armor that he had not tested and he had not tried. But what I also want you to know is that David didn't go into the battle naked. He went into the battle in a spiritual armor. Come on. Prepared for battle. Ready because of what he had been through. Armed with the word of God. And armed with uh, this uh, intent and this motivation for God's glory. Wow. You see, we need to be more familiar with the weapons of the spirit than the weapons of the flesh. Uh, the weapons of the flesh. We don't fight with people. We don't fight flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. We, yeah. we fight, we have a spiritual armor that we have been able to put on. And so David goes and when he has tested his staff, that trusted staff of his, that he had 
gotten the, the sheep out of trouble with, that he had guided them and pulled them out of danger with. Five smooth stones. I don't have time to talk about the five stones, but his shepherd's bag and his sling. And a whole lot of faith. <laughs> and he began to put that rock, that stone, into that sling. And he began to whirl it. <sighs> whirl it, whirl it, whirl it, because he had tested this. This was his arm, his was his uh, weapon of choice, and he's doing this number. And I can imagine as Goliath looks at him, what in the world is he going to do with that little thing? And all of a sudden, that stone kept getting larger and larger and larger. And it sinks into the skull of the giant. Knocks him forward. Now tell me, would a stone not hit in your head? Would it not normally knock you backwards? I'm going to give you something. But the giant fell forward, bowing to the same God that he had previously touched. You see, you don't need the weapons of the flesh. You don't need man's protection. You need God on your side. So David took these stones in his and in his faith, and he kills the giant. And, and, and all the time, uh, he's, he's believing that God is moving on his behalf. David was an insult to this large giant. It didn't look like it was a fair fight, can I tell you it wasn't? <laughs> but it was not a fair fight in the opposite direction. That's right. Because the king of glory... The almighty Jehovah God was with David. Amen. And when David uh, let loose of that stone, I believe that the power of God got behind it. And it yeah. began to propel it. And it moved it. And it stuck right in the strategic place to knock this giant forward. Somebody say it's not a fair fight. Because I'm going to win every time of the Lord. The Bible says that God be for you, who can be against you? Amen. David wasn't afraid. He was on mission. He knew that the battle belonged to the Lord. Can you say that with me? The battle belongs to the Lord. It's his battle. And when I step in, especially if I step in in fear, then I need to let God take control. The battle is the Lord's. It belongs to him. And, and if you look at this scripture, it tells us that David didn't kind of sneak up on the giant. He ran towards him. Amen. Ooh, I can imagine that young man. And he's, uh, here's the giant. He's too, too big and too bulky to run. He's too big and too bulky to get out of the way. And, and his head is so big that there's no way that David can miss. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he lets loose of the stone. You see, that day when David killed the giant, he hit him with the stone, and I believe it just knocked him out. And then he took the sword of Goliath, used the enemy's weapon on itself, and cut off his head. We need to make sure that the enemy's fully defeated, amen? And don't leave him alive to continue to do battle. Now, we all know this story. It's a great victory. It's a, a, a wonderful day for Israel. And we celebrate that even today. But it's not a greater victory than Jesus won at the cross. David's victory over Goliath was nothing but a foreshadowing and an advanced picture of the victory that Jesus would win on the cross. A champion is one who fights alone, single-handedly representing his nation or his kingdom. And if the warring nation agrees, then a great deal of bloodshed can be avoided. Yep. And I tell you that at the cross, a great deal of bloodshed was avoided. For you and I deserve to be on that cross. Amen. It was our sin that yep. put him there. Yep. A champion. 
The Greek word for champion means servant. Will you give me about five more minutes this morning? Great. I'm going to preach it anyway, so just... <laughs> a great man or a servant. It is amazing in the kingdom of God that a great man is not the one who has uh, necessarily the following, but who is the biggest servant of all. A champion. But what I love about the word champion in the Greek, it simply means this, the man in the middle. Hallelujah. Ah. Yeah. The man in the middle. Here's David standing in the middle between the two opposing armies. But here is Jesus on the middle cross uh, between the armies of Satan and, and, and his kingdom. And he is the one who is the champion in oh. the middle. Amen. Amen. David Patillo wrote a song called The Man in the Middle. It simply says, I love that man in the middle because I know he first loved me. Praise to the man who died on Mount Calvary. For the middle man made it possible that I could go free. Amen. Today we thank God for the middle man, Jesus. He's our champion. He won the battle and the victory for us. If you're a note taker, take notes fast because I'm going to try to do this quickly. D David and Jesus parallel. Look at this. Both represented their people and whatever happened to the representative happened to God's people. Because David was victorious, Israel was victorious. Because Jesus won the battle, we are victorious. Somebody get the order of God. David and Jesus both fought on ground that they had lost, uh, that had been lost, I should say, and that originally belonged to the kingdom of God. Both David and Jesus were sent to the battle by the Father. Both David and Jesus were rejected by their own people. Both David and Jesus used a strategy that was not a human strategy. Both David and Jesus Assured the victory before it even started. No doubt. Last one. Both David and Jesus rescued their people from captivity. This morning. If you're here this morning and under the sound of my voice, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that you're held captive to sin. Satan has you bound by your sin. But Jesus, when I say he's the middle man, he's my champion, has made a way. And because of what he did, you and I are victorious. Set free because of what Jesus did for us. Hebrews 12, 2 in the New Living Translation says that Jesus is our champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Yeah. If you're here this morning under the sound of my voice and you are a Christian, and you feel overcome by the weight and the uh, opposition and the uh, things that have come against you, I want you to know that you don't have to fight the battle on your own, that Jesus has already won the battle. That's right. Hallelujah. He is our champion. Yeah. Champion who has never lost a battle. Somebody preached with me this morning. And he never will. He's overcome darkness. He's broken the curse. He's conquered it all. Hallelujah. He's my champion. Would you raise your hands this morning in honor to the champion? The King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. The great and morning star. The Savior of the whole world. He is our champion. All glory to the King who's worthy of praise and honor. And there is no way we can lose because the champion is with us. He's my champion. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus is your Savior. We allow him to be your champion because he has defeated sin 
He has defeated death, hell, and the grave. And he finished that work on the cross. He said, it is finished. Look at your neighbor and say, it's finished. Pain and full. Nothing lacking. Because our champion has not only won the battle, but he's won the whole world.